Ardeth. Andy, it's so nice to see you. It's great to see you. The last time I saw you was in Boston. We had breakfast together. That's right. And um, we were eating um, muffins and blueberries. At Marketing Crafts B2B Forum, which is coming up in a month. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And here we are in Cleveland. We are. This is, I feel like this is like a, you are in the center of this giant community of content marketers. Like when I first heard about this whole orange thing, you were already here, like in the middle of it all. Well, I've been doing them since I started in 2011, which was over at the Renaissance Hotel. There was 200 people. And wow. now we have the entire conference center. Yeah. So lots of change. And it's not the only thing you do here. You're also part of the training you do. I mean, you're, you're deep in the, in the CMI community, right? Have been for a long time. Yeah, I've been an instructor for their CMI Academy or university, yep. whatever they call that. And I do a workshop every year in a session, just like you. <laughs> yep. We do what we can. It's, 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 uh, we're here to teach. We are. Yeah. Yeah. And so, it's exciting, all the changes. It's yeah. not the same as it was just a few years ago. Yeah. It's evolving and it's fun to see. There's, there's, uh, there's always new faces and, uh, and new tactics and, and, and new, um, new channels. Something that's been new, I know it's, it's a brand new on the scene. This was never done before. Something called account-based marketing. Oh, don't get me started. Come on, Andy. <laughs> you know, I mean... The thing for me is I've been doing what they now call account-based marketing for 20 years. And anybody who's marketing in B2B to a group of stakeholders has been doing account-based marketing or should be, right, forever. So it's not new. It's just that we have a fancy name for it now. Yeah. But it's also the advance of technology, right? So you can now see things you couldn't see before and gather the data where you didn't have that visibility before. But it's surprising to me how people have latched onto it like the next silver bullet. Yeah. But yet they haven't done the foundational work to drive a decent B2B content marketing program, let alone an ABM program. So, yeah. So is the foundational work for B2B and account-based marketing different from the foundational work that we've always been doing as marketers going back to traditional era? Well, I think the biggest difference from a marketing perspective is the ideal customer profile and the targeted accounts. So that's the biggest difference. That was usually left to sales to, you know, decide. And so marketers would target personas mm -hmm. and, you know, companies hopefully in their sweet spot area. But then there was really coordination with sales. So I think that's the biggest difference. I see. Is and I think it's necessary now because we need to get salespeople involved earlier. Yeah. And so when you look at it from what has now become ABM, it's more about marketing enabling sales. Yeah. Um, to build the relationships and get in the conversations more so than so it's a connected thing all the way across. Yeah. More so than marketing gets a lead, nurtures a lead, says, "Okay, it's right, now sales right. ready. Here you go, sales." And then Just sales takes it and chuck it over the fence. Does whatever they do. Something. And there's they nothing do. consistent and the yeah. poor buyer is sitting there going, okay, wait, what happened? Right. Right. And so I think that the difference there is attempting to tell a coordinated story across the yeah. entirety and have marketing and sales be seamless. Because when you think about it, does your buyer say, gee, I'm with marketing right now? Oh, no, I'm with sales right now. They don't care. They just want to have their problem solved. Right. Right. So, right. you know, so I think it's a bunch of hullabaloo, but you know, the biggest thing that irritates me beyond <laughs> anything else are the ABM gurus out there who are saying, well, now that you're focused on accounts, you don't need personas. Mm. And so I'm sitting there thinking, OK, so there are no more people in these companies. It's all robots now. And, and you know, since it's a, your target account, right. you sell to the building instead of the people <laughs> in the building. Right. And so it's not they seem to think that something changes, like the humanity goes out of it. If you're doing account-based marketing, and I'm not quite sure I follow that, you know, but, you know, writing on the coattails of that is the, you know, the development of AI, where I have a bunch of vendors calling to tell me how they can create personas using data. You don't need to talk to anybody, just use data. And the biggest problem I have with that is there's no context. You can look yeah. at all the data you want, but you don't know why that behavior happened, you know, or what that persona was thinking at the time and so i'm all for data but yeah. it's how you use it i think and you're that's one of your areas of expertise is the data so what are you seeing new with data well i want to get better results from every action i take 
So I use uh, website traffic data. I use Google Analytics to help me make decisions about what to focus on in terms of um, uh, topics or formats or uh, key phrases if I'm doing search or uh, open and click-through rates if I'm doing email. So yeah, I believe in using data to make decisions because yeah. uh, it's better than just going on whim or opinion or preference. Right. Um, but I'm interesting uh, example here for you because my audience is uh, pretty well defined and, this, and the, the marketing funnel is pretty short. You work with people who have a very long, like middle of funnel, like, like there's a lot of nurturing maybe. Right. Uh, and I know that you, you're big on data. I mean, you're known for the, the mm -hmm. insights you extract from platforms like LinkedIn when researching possible personas. Yeah. Maybe that's one of them, but, but how would you say, what, what's a good tactic for marketing enabling sales or how to collaborate with sales uh, to get better data, make better decisions and, and uh, do better uh, B2B marketing? Well, I think really, uh, well, I'll give you an example from a recent project that I did where I've been helping this company really hone their personas, develop a content strategy, do serial storytelling across the buying process to create momentum and all of this. And then we looked at their DGR team, their inside sales team, and they're sending out emails that say, hi, this is you know, Jim from so-and-so mm -hmm. just calling to see if I can get 15 minutes to tell you about my company. Who cares? Really? You know, and then the next no email connection. was, in case you didn't see my last email, I'm trying to follow up with you. Could we set a time to talk? Why? Who cares? And so we've now gone to them and said, let us help and shown them what we're doing and redrafted all of their emails to be around something that would pertain to a piece of content yep. that a lead looked at and saying, you know, you just read content about this issue. Yeah. I have some insight about this issue that might apply to your business and how we could help you. Do you have 15 minutes? I'll share some insight with you or whatever. And um, created a string of emails that relate to behavior that prospects may have just done, right? So they get triggered and out yeah. of the CRM for that. And they are seeing a tremendous transformation in the amount of calls they're able to book and meetings they're able to have um, just because they're now talking about something that's yeah. relevant rather right. than just saying, hey, give me 15 minutes so I can talk sure. to you about my company. Yeah. Like, who cares? Context. Yeah. So it, the email is still maybe a cold email. Or mm -hmm. has this? do we have evidence that this, this prospect has visited the website? Or yes. do we know? How well do we know in these examples that the audience is going to be interested in that topic or how do how is that discovered right well when the when the lead downloads that content or views that content it triggers an email we have the emails loaded from the rep so it triggers the email from the rep and the reps then alerted that we sent the email wow so they're ready to follow up and so um it's really cool actually and oh. uh but it puts the rep in a place of having a, a valuable conversation yeah. and imparting expertise instead of yeah. just let me tell you about my company so I can sell you something type of thing, which nobody wants to do. So it's you know. a, that's super <laughs> which lame. Which buyer ever said, please call and try to sell me something? Zero you know. percent of no. prospects have ever said, send yeah. me a cold email. So it sounds like there's a research piece determining what the conversation should be. There's a setup piece of creating the content, including the follow-up emails and the download itself and the lead mm -hmm. magnet and the, the call to action. There's a technology piece where it's sent out. There's a follow-up and activity piece. Mm -hmm. Where is the big investment or the obstacle for companies in that set of, you know, required actions and setup and writing and follow-through? Well, most of the investment is the front end, okay? So the personas, right, to develop the right content marketing strategy and then the storyline and developing all that content that creates the initial engagement that yeah. you can then build off of. Yeah, yeah. So... Most of my clients already have the technology. They just may not be using it in the most optimal way. But you have to have that foundation of the personas and the content and the story in order to put the rest of it together. Right. So I think that's, and that's time consuming. The right? research and the so, content piece is bigger yeah. than the, is the technology expensive for these things? I mean, not to name names, and I'm actually not in, in that world, but do we need to spend a thousand bucks a month on some fancy automation tool? Yeah, you're going to spend more than a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. But, but yeah, uh, that helps. You do because unless you're going to do it all manually, and so for my clients, they're trying to interact with twenty thousand accounts, right, 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 or leads, or however you want to term it. But there's thousands of thousands that they have to engage with should the activity occur, and doing that manually is yeah. ridiculous. 
So you, you do need the automation. And But the most important thing I think about is the integration of the data across silos. So you need your marketing automation integrated with your CRM, integrated right. with your data analytics, oh, yeah. you know, so that you actually get that visibility. Because otherwise, I think what I see a lot of my clients struggling with is the marketing team has to access all these different yeah. applications in their tech stack in yeah. order to figure out what's going on. And by the time they manually compile everything, it's all changed, right? Because two weeks has gone by or whatever. That's mm -hmm. what I was wondering about. And this is what really interests me because I'm always trying to iterate and get slightly better results knowing that I'm gathering data. So in this process, let's say it's set up and let's say I'm your client and I've got 20,000 prospects and a team of salespeople and marketers and we connect all those dots. Mm -hmm. What happens or when does it happen that I get new input about that download is outperforming or underperforming or the conversation changed or the audience is following this trend now or you know this salesperson isn't good at that follow-up or this topic is on fire right now or where does the data come in after the setup to iterate and improve and optimize the, the system? Well, there's a number of different ways. I mean, now, and you use Google Analytics, right? So it's basically what, next day? Do you get sure. it, yep. right, when right. it updates? The, the difference is what you're looking for. So, for example, if you're looking for a hot topic, it may mm -hmm. be that you see views spike on something. If you're looking for patterns or trends, you need some time, right? Right. So so it's it depends on what you're looking for. The thing for me is to you need to figure out what to benchmark. So you've mm -hmm. got to have a plan for what you want to measure, like what's impactful, mm -hmm. right? So from the, if we go back to ABM, what we're looking for now is engagement and coverage, right? How many contacts at your target accounts and how much engagement are you building with them so that we can have the better opportunity of getting sales involved, right? So you want to look at dwell time on pages, how many of the contacts are actually engaging with the content and what have you. And if you see a spike in that behavior, then you know there's something to take action about, right? I love it. And so it's, but it depends on what you're looking for. Like I said, if you if you publish something on a hot topic and all of a sudden you've got a thousand downloads, good, create more of that offshoots, you know, right, right, right on that topic. And you can find that out pretty fast, Yeah. right? But some other things take time, you know, like if you're monitoring progression, like are you moving people from one stage to the next stage? Mm -hmm. Right. By what they're based on what they're interacting with, what questions they're getting answered with your content that could take, you know, a month. What's the change from last month to this sure. month yeah. or a quarter? Yeah. Right. Depending on your sales cycle. So or your buy time. And so it just depends. Right. Do you have ways to uh, for the sales team to pass information back to the marketers about what conversations they're having, what topics this audience is asking about? Are there how, how to how is this? It, or is the conversation two ways? Well, it it depends on the maturity of the client, right? So quite often my clients, it's a manual conversation thing, like every Monday morning in the meeting, you know, they get yeah, feedback yeah. and anecdotal stuff. Some of my clients actually have a closed loop process where okay. sales can provide feedback or they have um, the capacity like through a, a Capost, a content management platform or yep. something like that, uh -huh. where they can see salespeople have accessed this content so they I know see. they're using it so they can go, you know, get feedback from sales about it. And so it just depends on how they've set that up. Yeah. The, it's one of the hardest things is to make sure that they're talking to each other because in a lot of companies, it's still new, right? Yeah. Sales is used to saying, don't play with my toys. You yeah. keep on yeah, your yeah. side and I'll keep on my side. And yeah. And so, you know, I, and I'm doing a lot of work with industrial manufacturing companies right now, mm. which have always been product driven and they're now losing market share because their competitors are embracing content marketing, customer focus and all sure. that. So they're trying to shift, but the way they've always done it is sales does the selling, right. marketing produces, you know, the product briefs and the, you know, Never between right. shall meet. And so trying to figure out how do you create that yeah. working relationship and, and when sales has never seen value from marketing, right? Because they produce the data yeah, sheets or culture, the whatever. Culture gap there. You know, but the other thing that you said something when we were talking earlier about how you're using data to figure out what topics yep. and, you know, what content to repurpose and that sure. kind of thing. So what are you looking for when you do that? Well, there are two kinds of possible of articles on your website, on any website that would get the greatest benefit from an update or from attention or love or care or improvements. Those would be the articles that are already attracting a lot of visitors. Mm -hmm. For example, they're ranking very high in search, but the search 
traffic is declining, the rank is declining, other people are publishing new stuff, better stuff on this topic, and you're no longer the best page on the internet for that topic. Mm -hmm. And when this happens, sometimes there's like a few blockbuster posts that most websites have a small number of articles that are driving most of the traffic. Right. If you don't pay attention to those those few, you know, unicorns or the champions, you know, the ones that are really winning, then there's a risk that uh, if they fall in traffic, your total top line traffic will decline a lot. Mm -hmm. It's not that uncommon. So even if it's something that you wrote like five years ago that's still pulling a lot of traffic? If it's an important topic, if it's relevant to my audience and if it's mm -hmm. valuable, then yes. If it's an irrelevant post, then who cares? It doesn't matter. And the traffic you were attracting wasn't high quality anyway. Right. But yeah, there's lots of articles on lots of our websites that are excellent, but they're not as excellent as they used to be. They were driving tons of traffic, right? If it's mousetraps and cheese, this is the best cheese. It's attracting lots of visitors. Right. And then as that begins to decline, uh, your total traffic declines a lot. And that page is now much less visible because it went from page two to page one. Those should be updated and improved and will improve rankings and make a big difference, big impact on your traffic almost immediately. Mm -hmm. The other ones are the articles that are, that are converting a great percentage of visitors into subscribers. Okay. So most websites have a small number of articles that convert a, a much bigger percentage of visitors into subscribers than others. Mm -hmm. We, uh, uh, the typical website will have visitors, will have articles that convert 1% of visitors into subscribers and others that convert 0.001% of visitors to subscribers. Right. If you don't know, if you don't have visibility into that, if you've never calculated your conversion rate from visitor to subscriber per article, mm -hmm. then you don't know which of these things you should be promoting most or promoting best, or you don't know where your best mousetraps are. Right. So this is Barry Feldman's quote. You know, if the website is the mousetrap, the content's the cheese. Once you know what your best mousetraps and your best cheese are, mm -hmm. first of all, you can make internal links between those and connect the traffic right. champions to the conversion champions and get better results almost immediately by making right. one link, you know, like a yeah. next link to go to the... But the other benefit is just that um, you're going to uh, protect your top line traffic and search rankings and visibility. Mm -hmm. You're going to promote those things however you can. Put them on your homepage. Put them in your email signature right. that, that, are con that are doing the best job at list growth. So yeah, that, it's maybe an hour of analysis that will show you which things need the most love, which articles would benefit from a light rewrite or an improvement or going deeper on the topic. Mm -hmm. We just mentioned several trends already. If if you were talking about it in one way and now the conversation moved over here, you can just jump into that, you know, stay in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I use data to make decisions on that, how to make better decisions um, for what to promote or what to improve. And my content, I'm, I'm moving toward a strategy of updating old things. I know. I love that because you should. You have an investment there. Why wouldn't you repurpose? It makes so much sense. So let me ask you this because I keep seeing this everywhere. It's like... <clears throat> There used to be this strategy for SEO, all the things you needed to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. And now what I'm seeing is, okay, it doesn't matter anymore because all Google cares about is quality content. So if you write quality content, you're going to do well in search engines. So do you no longer need to have your keyword in the title, in the header, in the first paragraph? And Myth. It's just, it's superstition and it's nonsense. The things people believe about search are so bizarre okay, to me. Okay, which part's the myth? that you don't need to indicate oh, relevance okay. and target right, a good. phrase. Okay. So here's a prescriptive <laughs> approach to what I call semantic SEO. This yeah. is semantic SEO, okay. which is about targeting the topic, not just the phrase. Right. We still must target the key phrase. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, if, we're, if, if you and I are collaborating on a piece about developing personas for B2B, mm -hmm. and we decide that that's going to be our focus for this article, it might be B2B persona development. And that we still have a primary key phrase, and we still use that phrase in the title, in the header, and in the body text. Right. You just will not rank if you don't indicate relevance for something. Right. And you have to be specific and make go deep on that topic. But it's insufficient to just have a primary key phrase and think that by using B2B personal development four times in a thousand-word article that that's going to rank. Right. That's silly. Yeah. That's not how Google works. Google's trying to find the best page on the topic. Mm -hmm. So we go deeper without losing focus on the primary or our main target key phrase. We go deeper on the topic by discovering very simply, you know, what are the related searches at the bottom of the search result? We search for B2B persona development. At the bottom, it has, it mentions account-based marketing. It mentions uh, persona writing. It mentions persona research. Okay, so you need to also consider adjacent terms to Use the topic. Perfect word. Okay. Exactly. All Use right. all the adjacent, make a list of them. Uh -huh. This is a prescriptive way to do yeah. killer SEO. 
make a list of all those adjacent terms. I uh -huh. might steal that from you. Thank you. That's a great way to describe it. And just incorporate those into the article. Yeah. Which, by the way, now our article is going to be 2,000 words because we didn't think about because you can't just stuff them in there. You got to no. make sure that they're in context with what you're talking about. So your your B two B persona research, B two B persona development article, is now answering all the related questions, going deeper on the topic. It. it is more thorough and exhaustive yeah. than it would have been. SEO has made us a better writer, and now we're ranking. We're more likely to rank for that primary phrase and all the adjacent phrases. So would you say that if you take that approach, you need less content to rank better? Yeah, so if you, it, you're going you're to have more of those traffic champions, mm -hmm. and you're going to find that you're getting, yeah, you don't need to have a medium quality post every week. Mm -hmm. You might need to have a really in-depth post every two weeks. Mm -hmm. You'll get way more traffic yeah. with less effort, right? The see, internet's that's... not waiting for another medium quality blog post. Right. Because that's a, one of the biggest challenges is, especially when you start creating personas, right? It's a multiplier. So you have right. to create... You know, instead of creating content for one persona, you now got five. So that's five pieces. And then right. you have to keep doing it. And so one of the questions, in fact, after my workshop today, somebody came up to me and said, we have 15 nurture tracks and we've got X amount of personas and we have to create storylines and it's just getting out of hand and we need all this content. And what's the secret to doing this? How do I do this without having to create so much, you know? And, and so it's kind of like look for the overlays and things like that. But if you can get more right. coverage... Right. With one piece, by looking at those adjacent topics, yep. then you can, you know, get more accomplished and you don't need to create so right. much. And I think there's this fear that people have that if they're not publishing all the time, that they're going to not be relevant in the search rankings and all that. But I don't think it's the speed of publishing. I think no. it's the quality of what you put out. Is that fair? It's, I think it, well, you said earlier, like, does anyone say, hey, where's my cold email today? Yeah. No. 0% of right. prospects or visitors are looking for mediocrity or anonymity, right? right. They're, they're, they're trying to find something great. Huh. So if you have 15 of them, whoa, you might advise that client to narrow it down. But let's say we've got 15. Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen anybody who needed 15 before. What's the max? <laughs> well, it depends. In her case, in all fairness, she said to me, well, we're not just talking buyers we're talking customer retention and we're talking partners okay. and we're Post. talking yeah. you know so when you add all those up okay maybe but generally i haven't seen a need for more than five great personas so let's you know? say we've got five and sometimes what the information they need overlaps sure so you create the body of it and yeah. then you change the intro and the conclusion and the title and whatever yeah. make it relevant to that persona but you're not reinventing the wheel five times no and people don't look at those overlaps they think they have to do something unique and different for every touch point, for every persona. Yeah. And it just, I mean, I had a client who had four personas and we were doing a project to address them across the course of a year. And it was like 240 pieces of content. And they no, just, their no. eyes got oh, all big. Man. And I was like, you don't need to do that much. No. You know, you can consolidate a lot of this down. And there are places yeah. where topics overlap. People need to know the same kinds of information but they need it in a perspective that matches theirs. And so, so you can just re rework it. I would tell these people, yeah. you've got five personas. <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, you're crazy. Here's what we're going to do instead. You've got five personas. Each of these personas has, you know, 20 questions they might need to have answered before they become a lead or, or, or purchase or buy or sign up. Mm -hmm. There's five of those that are the really big questions. Have we published... The super detailed, thorough, just, just best answer on the internet for each of those five questions for each of those four people. Mm -hmm. And just keep refining and polishing those. Make the alternate version in video. Make the, you know, make the adjacent articles, you know, publish that in every form with every, you know, have you gotten the influencer included in each of those? And just keep working on each of those as a little hub of content for each of those and just. See, that's key is the hub. Yeah, building you know, up, you know. Give, giving them access to more information. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, funny because people think that if they publish something once they can't do it again because everybody will remember oh, nobody, nobody will remembers. remember <laughs> no they will not remember and that's why people don't get enough use out of their content because they think republish relaunch yeah, how exactly. about so i'm gonna get a question is it uh six months old we can assume that this is new to our audience if we republish it is it a year definitely a year old right mm -hmm. they don't remember this thing it's a year old now tweak the headline give it a new image you know, put a new coat of paint on this. You can put things back in rotation, which means another email, put them back in social streams, 
relaunch. Yeah, people don't remember. Right. I'd say six months is, is uh, you can. Hey, I downloaded something last week and downloaded again yesterday because I thought, wow, this is interesting. And then I downloaded, it took me a few minutes and I went, wait, I just read that, you know, but I mean, a you week, got value. Yeah. you know, yeah, because it resonated with me. And so, you know, but if it's been a while, I won't remember that I read it before because I read so much stuff, but it's the same for prospects. I don't remember either. They're busy. No. So, so know your audience. You know. Mm -hmm. Enable the sales team by breaking down that wall and and, and getting mm -hmm. and giving them what they really need to engender trust, and you'll get more cooperation from them later. Yeah. Uh, make decisions based on data. Mm -hmm. uh, go back and and find things that were working, and starting to slide, or were working, and would get more benefit from that attention. Yeah. And relaunch, repurpose, update, mm -hmm. put that back into heavy social rotation. Send it as another email. Get that you know put yeah. that back on the front line. Yeah. I agree with you. And I, the other thing I do too is reuse stuff all the time. Yeah. So it's like, you never want to have a dead end with your content. You always exactly. want to connect oh. to something else. And so we write, you know, a lot of times we'll do a nurture program that we have off nav, right? So that we can keep reusing it and putting sure. leads in. But we'll also do a parallel blog series that's public, but we cross link. Yeah. Yeah. You know, from the nurture to the blog to also give them additional information. Yeah. But you always want to have the next step. What's right. next for everybody? You never want to leave them going, okay, thanks, see ya. Right. right? You always want to give them something else and extend that engagement while you have them. Yeah. You know, and so um, it's, but there's ways to create content where you get more use, right? Yeah. So what, by creating the blog in parallel, they're getting stuff published on their blog. Sure. But we're also using it to extend engagement with yeah. the nurture. And if somebody stumbles upon the website, finds an interesting blog post maybe they opt in yeah, from the sure. blog to get into your nurture and so there's a lot of different ways to look at how to put it together so you're not just randomly i see people randomly creating content because they think they need more they need to publish every tuesday at 10 or whatever that strange Ditch thing is. that publishing calendar i've got i'll share with you a theory i have i don't have data for this i would love to study this somehow <laughs> i have a theory that people like to click on next buttons Really? And that if you say, like, I love what you said about dead ends, and I recommend that too. It's like, find and right. fix every dead end in your website. There's lots of dead ends on people's website. Thank you right. pages are often dead ends, right? Mm -hmm. Give people something more in every case, on every right. page. But yeah, if you scroll down to the bottom of an article, and there's just the footer, well, that's a basically a failure. A call to action mm -hmm. might work. But um, depending on the source of traffic, that person might have come just for the information, right? They're just at an mm -hmm. informational query. They're here for answers. Mm -hmm. What if we just try putting like a next button or a link that just says next? I have a theory that people just like to click on next buttons. Yeah, but the trick with that is if they click on next and it's something that doesn't continue on the story, right. if it's not related to what they just read, then it's like bait and switch, right? I should have known you'd say that, Artie. <laughs> you are a pathological, empathetic person. Pathological. You're pathologically <laughs> empathetic. You are obsessed with, this, with the audiences. <laughs> yes. No, it's great. It's killer but empathy. It's, but it's one of the reasons why you spend, I spend so much time working on that storyline, sure. right? So that stuff connects together so that you can use it in that way. Yeah. And I like the theory of the next button. I think I'm going to try that and yeah, see just what next. happens. <laughs> I, have a, I think people just click on next. If they see next, they're more like... It's an interesting idea. But just it, let's test that. As long rate. as you have content that is next, what, what happens a lot of times, and I'm working on a project like this right now with a client where they said, we have all this content. We need to create a track for this persona you just built for us. Go figure out how that works. Yeah. And I'm looking at their content going, you got nothing that this persona cares about. Nothing. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, how do we fix that? Because they're like, we got all this content. We have to reuse it and yeah, make yeah. it work. And I'm like, okay, we're going to have to like repurpose. I mean, I've dug through 500 assets and I found two things that maybe with a rewrite would be relevant to that persona. Because they're, they've always resonated with the engineering side of the house, and now they need to yeah. resonate with the business side. They have nothing. So it's translating, you know, stuff. But that's why it's so important to look at the foundation first, right? Because yeah. you can't just launch because you want a program. And they're like, make content work for this. Well, okay, we have to rewrite stuff. All right, if I could talk to you all day, work. and we're going to run out of time. But I want to ask you this. How important is it that the content in these storylines and for these pe personas and people how important is the originality? Oh, I think it's hugely important. I, because if you look at it from the perspective of you're trying to become that expert resource yeah, yeah. for your buyers mm -hmm. or your customers, 
you know, and reinforce that and bring something to the table they can't get anywhere else. Yeah. How do you get that if it's not original, if it's not your SMEs, if it's not your expertise, if it's not your unique take on the yeah. world, you know, in relation to whatever problem you solve? I, you know, and it's Gore Pawan from Curata, and yeah. I have had this feud going on forever, right? Because I'm like against curation, you know? And it was really funny. A couple of years ago, I realized that when I'm tweeting, I'm curating, right? Because I'm sharing sure. everybody oh, else's yeah, that's, stuff. That's and so I actually admitted it on Twitter. I think he has it framed in his office, you know, that I actually admit a curation is useful. But you need to, you can share other people's thoughts, you know, but yeah. you should always build on them. You right. know what I Add mean? If you're, if you're going Definitely. to share somebody else's, say, this is really great. But in addition to that, what about this other thing? You yeah. know, so you're adding your thinking. But you can also share other people's stuff. You just have to do it in a way that that still has you being helpful, not just being lazy. Right, right. right? Yeah. So I, there's a difference there, I think. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's uh, you are as always um, <laughs> an evangelist for quality. I'm not surprised for empathy, for originality. Oh well, thank you. This... You know, I you are right up there at the top, and what you do as well. I can't. I've hear nothing but great stuff about I, what you do. We, we try. We work hard, right? It's a job that's never done. No, it isn't. Thankfully for us, we'll always have a job, right? <laughs> From one marketer to another. It's a good thing that we've still got work to do. Uh, it's been great yeah. seeing you, Andy. Thanks, Arden. It's a pleasure.